Good morning. I hope you can hear me out there. Um, my name's Tom Briggs. Thank you for joining us today for another Jagged Glow presentation. Last week, Ed Chard took us on a mountaineering journey on the east coast of Greenland. And this week, we've got British mountain guide Andy Owen, who's going to talk to us about the world of ski touring. So this is one of a series of interviews and discussions about mountaineering, trekking and skiing with various Jagged Globe leaders and guides that we're running over the next few weeks. Um, coming up next week, we have expedition leader and leader of next year's Everest expedition, Robert Mads Anderson. Robert's going to talk about all things to do with Everest. And following that, over the next few weeks, we're also going to be talking to David Hamilton, about trekking and mountaineering in the Karakoram. We're going to be chatting with Mungo Ross. Mungo led more expeditions and treks than any other Jagged Globe leader um, for us. And he's um, he's been to Kilimanjaro many times over the years. And he's going to talk about the changes um, that he's seen over that time on, on Africa's highest mountain. And we're going to have Mara Larson, who's led multiple expeditions to Aconcagua over the last few seasons, Aconcagua being the highest mountain outside of the Himalaya. And we'll also have some other speakers coming up as well. So just keep an eye out on our social media channels and the news page on our website. So as I said, our speaker today is British mountain guide Andy Owen. Andy guides for us in the Alps during the spring, summer and the winter. And in the springtime, he guides on skis as skis are arguably the best way to enjoy the high mountains at that time of year. Now, ski touring or ski mountaineering, the two, two terms, I suppose, are interchangeable, um, has really exploded in popularity over the past couple of decades, especially as ski technology uh, has improved and made it more accessible to the occasional skier. Um, you know, modern skis have meant that it's quicker to learn how to ski off piste away from the busy resorts. But there's a lot to consider when you're skiing on terrain away from the safety of the piste. So Andy's going to dive into this topic of ski touring um, in a minute. The, the format of today's session will be uh, a, a, probably about a 40 minute presentation, followed by up to 20 minutes of, of Q&A. Um, now, the second half of Andy's talk includes quite a few slides from the famous Hope Route ski tour. Um, now I will interject in suitable places with your questions, which you're free to add um, in the Q&A there. Um, but I'm going to bring in, I'm going to bring in Andy now. Um, let me just uh, bear with me one second. And hopefully he will appear on your screen. Here he comes. Hello, Andy. Good morning. Thanks for the intro, Tom. No problem. I'll uh, I'll let you take us through the the world of of ski touring. The entire world of ski touring. <laughs> so, I mean, it's getting getting around the mountains on skis. Historically, that's how a lot of um, mountain travel originated. You know, Norwegians and Scandinavians and so on. It, it's it's fundamentally the most efficient way of moving around on a snowy surface. Um, it's a little extra effort going up the hill, taking the skis with you, but that's more than compensated by uh, being able to just slither on down back the hill. Uh, and of course, that's that's a fun part of the day as well. Um, it's been increasingly noticeable with uh, summers being warmer in the Alps that uh, a lot of the terrain um, that uh, gets stripped of snow in the summer is is actually quite easy and uh, unchallenging in the winter. So more and more for sort of simple snowy and glaciated terrain, uh, that winter environment's more attractive uh, and uh, easier to move around on. The, I suppose the stumbling block for a lot of folks is you've got to be able to ski uh, and um, it needs a bit of input at the beginning 
to uh, to start that process. The other thing that's very noticeable for me, um, I, I think a lot of people that start ski touring, is um, your foot never leaves the floor. So in terms of impact on the body, whilst it's physical, it's still muscular effort. You know, we can't get around that, I'm afraid. We're away from the lifts, nobody's dragging us up the hill. And there's no impact. Um, so uh, it's a lot easier on the knees, the hips and the backs. Some of us are getting older, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, it really is. No, so when, when, I, when I look at the impact on my body between, say, doing a week in Scotland where you're going up and down on your feet all day uh, and a week on ski touring. Uh, yes, I'm tired, but um, but my knees don't hurt and my back doesn't hurt and all of that. So uh, as we move on past our maybe 50th birthday or something, uh, if you can ski, I think it's still it's a, it's a it's a great way of getting around the mountains uh, without um, damaging yourself, shall we say? Yeah. Um, so yeah, the big thing is, of course, when people want to start, is am I able to ski well enough? Okay, I've got a little chart there. Uh, it's it's all a composite, so these things aren't directly related. Although, as we go across, it's the, maybe the biggest affecting factors, but uh, but they're all be interlinked. So yeah, you should be able to move around uh, and pieced terrain without really worrying about it. And if you get on a steeper run, maybe a black run or something, then you should be at the level where you've got some skills to cope with it, even if you can't ski linked turns. So if you've got a nice bit of black and you can just go down using your edges and side slipping, those are the skills you'd need for ski touring. The control is the main thing. Uh, you need to be a controlled skier and someone that doesn't get phased when they see something uh, that they don't feel confident to ski in a linked way. Um, the better your technique is, the easier everything will seem. So if you've got a good level of technical skiing, um, then all the rest of it will will maybe be OK. You can have, you can maybe not be as fit and um, it can be a little newer to you. But if your skiing's spot on, uh, you're not going to be challenged by that. You get a lot more enjoyment out of it. Uh, what challenges our technique the most is it's, it's off piste. It's not a piste environment. So the snow is whatever we get. It might be wonderful powder. It might be tracked out and almost groomed. It might be spring snow, which is easier than corduroy or it could be an inch and a half of breakable crust, which is um, challenging. <laughs> and if you've got a good selection of ski techniques, so not just your parallel skiing, the things you learned to do before that, the stem turns and the snow plows and all that, you notice with experienced skiers, they'll just drop one link down that chain and adapt the skiing if the conditions get difficult. Um, if you inherently got good balance, that helps because you're going to be skiing with a rucksack on, uh, and you could have problems with visibility uh, and that can affect it. Obviously, your balance gets affected if your technique's not as good or the snow conditions aren't great, but it's that addition of weight and take that taking people back. So the better you are at staying over the mid-ski, and that's something you definitely learn if you're uh, carving on piste at speed, um, then that's going to help. Overall robustness, so taking the knocks as it were, and you know now and again you get one ski taken by a lump or one ski sinks a bit more and you can just urge yourself around you've got the weather you've got the altitude you've got a little bit of mountain exposure and also you know things like the hort route you're spending five nights in a row in huts you might not get as much sleep as you're expecting so that overall um robustness helps and again you know working back through that if your ski technique's good then even though you're tired and feeling a bit grotty and um, the altitude is just affecting you a bit, you're not going to be knocked back quite so much. Physical strength. So the stronger and fitter you are, the, especially for the uphill, the easier it's going to be. And also, if your technique isn't as good, to some degree, to some degree, you'll be able to compensate if your physical level's high. You know, you can afford to take the odd fall and you'll get back up and it won't be so tiring. Whereas if physically you're not that fit, then you'll need to be able to ski competently. Otherwise, you'll you'll become exhausted. So often we get out on the hill and uh, there's, you know, skiing around inside the ping pong ball days where there's a bit of mist, the cloud comes and goes. 
um, and there's maybe no tracks to follow. Uh, so all those things come together in that environment. You need good skiing, you need good balance, you need to be physically fit. Um, and then you get onto more open exposed slopes as well, where you look down the length of the slope and it can be a little intimidating. And again, having that strong background of knowing that, yeah, OK, I, I don't think I can do link turns down here. I don't want to risk it. I don't feel that confident, but I do have some other things I know I can do. I can traverse and hop round or I can do a little bit of a side slip and get to somewhere I want to turn. And often we'll pick where we want to turn and make the turn there rather than being forced into trying to ski it in a way we, th you know, we think everyone else thinks we should. Um, we're very much in control of making our own choices. Um, so we pick our way around, um, choose where we're going to make the turns uh, and uh, you know, put ourselves in places where we feel comfortable and safe and have the techniques to um, to get through that terrain. So, yeah, it's all a composite. All those things will add up um, uh, and uh, the stronger you are, then you can maybe get away with not being such a good skier. If you are a good skier, uh, you still need to have some fitness for, for, for doing the slogs uphill. So we've got various ways of getting uphill um, and the most straightforward, we've got the next slide, is um, taking the skis off and putting them on your backpack. So if there's a bit of a track, especially from uh, skiers having put in a skinning track before and there's a short distance to go, the snow might be firm, it's not worth putting the skins on. And in a lot of resorts, um, you know, this this is in Andermatt where there's a short boot pack to get up and over a col, or I'm thinking in Verbia, there's quite a few. Stairway to Heaven is a classic off-piece run there, and it's just 40 minutes boot packing up a slope. The touring boots are better for this than ski boots because they've got a Vibram sole, so you do get some grip. And it's amazing how well a really stiff plastic boot holds in snow. Once things have had a bit of traffic and you've got um, boot steps already there for you, it is just like walking up a ladder. It's quite tiring. Um, it, it's it's like being on the Stairmaster going at it full bore, but uh, it's, um, it's efficient. And then we've got the skins to go on the bottom of the skis. So it used to be seal skin, all the hairs point one way. So as it slides, it bites backwards. Um, it's a combination of all sorts of modern materials on them now, but uh, that has a uh, glue on the base of it and that goes on the bottom of your ski. So as you slide the ski forward, uh, it doesn't slip back. Very efficient. Um, the, uh, the rate of ascent is something you can control, so you can adjust the angle because you're zigzagging. So you don't, you're not forced into going steep. Um, there's often a track there in front of you, um, but you can put a new track in if you think that's that's more appropriate. Getting used to skinning, um, that just comes with a little practice. So what the ski will hold and how you stand on the middle of the ski has quite a big effect on how well it grips. The size of the ski will have some effect on that as well, but maybe not as much as technique. Um, we often feel, I think, we often feel most exposed when we're skinning. Once we're skiing, there's a little bit more movement and control and focus on getting down the slope. Whereas when you're skinning, you're going slower and you've got more chance to look around you. And if you're unsure uh, of um, of the skins holding, I think that's probably when people's anxiety um, comes in a little bit. So yeah, you start off with with easier, more moderate terrain. Um, and if you get onto steeper ground, often with people that haven't done as much skinning, you might go to doing a boot pack uh, just because doing uh, kick turns where you where you kick the skis around on steeper terrain is hard. And also, you, know, you don't want to risk people blowing um, blowing the, the skin in the track uh, and, and slithering down a bit. So um, just a quick question, Andy, on on the skinning. I mean, often you read in itineraries that, um, you know, a particular day has got, say, you know, 800 metres of, of vertical um, gain that, that you would need to skin. I mean, is is skinning, is it, is it more time consuming or is it quicker than walking uphill? I mean, what's a sort of typical 
time for say going 100 meters up i always work on about 300 meters an hour of ascent that that's right. a that that's a moderate place pace yeah, most most people seem to get on all right with that it's a fairly slow rhythm at a modern moderate angle uh, it's something people can sustain so we can certainly do a thousand meters at that speed uh, so it's three hours to do a thousand meters that's that's um that 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 works so so um sure. the, for the vast majority of groups that rate of ascent is very attainable without anybody sweating or huffing and puffing yeah. right there's a picture of my chalet in the alps <laughs> <laughs> uh that's having a play around in the back garden so those are my old uh ski boots and skis the 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 the, the, the kit um i mean if you're into your gear and a lot of outdoorsy types are and ski mountaineering is just wonderful uh because you get to be techy and really sort of uh pour over the details of things um so the platform we've got under us the ski that's going to make a big difference to how things feel. Unfortunately, there's a trade off between something that's fun and easy to ski in powder snow or challenging conditions and something that's easy to shift going uphill. So for powder skiing or whatever, you want something that's broad and gives you a good surface area, but it's going to be heavy. Um, and then if you want something that's just going to be easy for going uphill and make that physically easier, then skinnier skis are good for that. And skinnier skis will hold an edge better and they will skin better because you've just got more pressure over a smaller area. Um, so there's a fundamental trade off there. And if you've got those wider skis, like super wide ones, you get in a skinning track, you have an overlap then and, and, and it's really quite hard sometimes to hold. Uh, the ski in the track if they're bigger than, than, than the uh, the people that put the track in. Um, so yeah, the width of the ski, particularly the width under your midfoot, um, is going to have an effect. So I mean, modern powder skis, 90 to 100. I know powder skis go above 100 now, but the all mountain ones that we could maybe tour on, that's going to be fun. Uh, but once certainly if you get up to 100, that's adding to uh, weight and it could make your skinning harder uh, and less secure. You, you need a better level of skinning experience if you're going to uh, go on to steeper terrain skinning or something like that. Narrower skis, you know, so upper 70s to that 90 bracket, I suppose the majority of um, ascent um, sort of profiled skis are going to be in that bracket. So they're a little bit lighter. Um, you're narrower underfoot, so you, you're going to be able to hold an edge better if you're on steep ground, on steep icy ground, uh, and um, the skin will hold better for skinning, uh, and uh, you'll uh, you'll have less weight under your foot, so it won't be as tiring. So if you're looking at bigger mountain days, something like a ski Mont Blanc or something like that, um, then uh, you're going to want something like that under your foot if you're going to be skinning for five hours. And um, you'll feel the effects of a heavy ski for sure, unless you're super, super fit. So, yeah, for, for, for those longer trips where we've got longer days and, and often we say, oh, you need a better level of skiing and people go, but why the skiing's no harder? It's well, the days are longer. And you're going to be more tired, more fatigued and in a remoter area. So you need that reliability in those circumstances. So unless your ski ability is higher, when you go into a remoter area, um, you may be putting yourself uh, under extra hazard, really. Um, uh, so that's that's why we do things like that. The length of the ski, uh, that's dictated to a large degree by your height, unless you're a racer where they have the little short ones. Um, whether it's a soft or hard ski, I mean, the, the ones I've got just behind me are actually fairly soft and I got on those, with those very well. A lot of people prefer a harder ski. That to some degree is personal preference, I think, and being used to the ski and what it does. Um, rocker, that's it being curved at the tip. I find that more use almost than the width under my foot um, in that that keeps the tip out of uh, crud and crap and um, troublesome snow, helps initiating the turn uh, and 
um, if I'm breaking trail, keeps the tip above it. Because if the tips sink, sink under like a submarine once you're breaking trail, then the pressure's up against your boot and it's just drawing feet of lead through through the stuff. It's much harder. Uh, uh, but fundamentally, the most important thing is the deck design. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, they got to look good. You've got to like them. Uh, it's a little disappointing. I think a lot of modern ski design just is a little dull. Um, it's a, a little clinical techie, maybe. I don't know. Um, I like the old style graphics. There we are. You like, That's you just like me. The, you like the 80s uh, bright, bright fluoro colours. Yeah, and the kind of cartoon <laughs> characters on them and things like that. OK, so, um, so yeah, what about bindings? <clears throat> so bindings, uh, and we've got somebody who's had an unwanted binding release in the picture there. OK, so reliability. Uh, I think I've pretty much seen all sorts of bindings uh, fail or break. So uh, nothing's perfect. Some are a little better than others. Uh, but the moment you start saving weight, and this is a very lightweight setup here, I've got ski touring boots, uh, clipping at the toe with pin bindings. Um, there's not a lot of metal there. Uh, and if you are going to ski hard in something like that, there's a good potential you'll break a bit of it. It might be the screws come out of the ski. Um, but they are lighter for going uphill. So that gives you a um, le less physical activity, shall we say. It's going to make it's going to make life a bit easier. But if you if you fall over and hurt your knee because they didn't release, well, that's not a great equation. Uh, so you, when you buy these things, I mean, the pin bindings right now in the market are super popular, uh, but inherently they 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 uh, they're a limited bit of kit. They are um, not entirely reliable when it comes to a toe release. I would say if I've ever had a problem with bindings um, not coming off when they should have come off, in my opinion, it's always been a pin binding of virtually any sort. OK, mm. um, and I think when we look at the history of um, uh, incidents uh, that guys have had with people hurting their knees, I think that's borne out by that as well with pin bindings. Uh, other styles of binding, and this is increasing in the marketplace now. I mean, historically, we've had uh, like these Diamir Fritchie bindings in front of us now. Um, they're heavier. And on those who stood a little bit above the ski, that has its pros and cons. Uh, but you do get a good toe release out of them. Uh, uh, they're easy to put on as well. That's the other thing with pin bindings. It can be a little awkward to get back on your feet. The toe piece has to be completely clear uh, of any snow or ice. And the ski must be flat. There's, there's no way around it, really. Uh, these, um, those uh, with, with the toe piece, so there's these Fritchie bindings, which have been around for years. Uh, Salomon have got some new bindings out, which are a bit like that. Marker have been making them. Yes, they're heavier. Uh, if you want to ski harder and also use them for resort skiing as well, then I think that's a much better choice because um, you've just it, got. Sorry, go I was just going to ask, um, you know, does it matter how heavy a ski is? I mean, I'm, I'm a I'm a big guy, you know, 86 kilos. W would that influence your decision about the type of Binding. I'm not talking about the settings, but just you know whether or not you want a, a beefier binding on your ski. At some point, so the super super light bindings that'll be a come a consideration, but I don't think that's as important as uh, skiability. Um, right. So the better the better skier you are, uh, the, um, the the more pin orientated lighter the binding can maybe be. Um, that's the biggest affecting factor, I'd say. Um, yeah. yeah but then it, it, you know if you're heavier and you are an aggressive skier and you're going to want to charge then you really need to think about having something um that's going to spread the weight out on your ski um and that, that's going to need some sort of frame to it and so yeah the the bigger bindings yeah yeah so the kit we have to take with us because uh, we're not on the piste so always 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 transceiver shovel probe if you're skiing off piece and you don't have a rucksack on then there's got to be some serious questions okay um which is where's your shovel and your probe in your jacket because <laughs> uh, you can't dig people out with your hands and even if you've got a transceiver on uh it's too slow to get a rescue team in 
So the transceiver only works in conjunction with a shovel and probe. OK, uh, I haven't put airbag on there. A lot of people ski with airbags now. They don't replace any of this. You still need all the rest. OK, because it might not be you that goes under. Uh, and then for the majority of times out in the mountains, uh, we're going to want the skins. Kuto are ski crampons. Uh, so they're like an addition for when we get to harder terrain. Um, and then we put those on. They go under the foot. Um, uh, and uh, they're aluminium, so they can be a bit bendy on hard ice itself. If it gets too firm, then you're better off stopping and putting your crampons on your feet. Um, so crampons, mountaineering spikes that go on the on the boot, um, especially on a ski boot, very effective. But if the terrain is rocky, um, you're better off with the boot because you've no ankle flex in ski touring boots. Uh, so if they if you're rocking around, um, they can take your balance a bit to one side or the other. It feels very cumbersome. So sometimes you're better off without them. And again, uh, if you're boot packing through deep snow, um, you can catch your trousers with your crampons when you don't really need them. So you do need to think a bit. Uh, harness. So it, once we're skiing uh, in glaciated terrain, you must have a harness on. There's, it's going to be very uncomfortable getting someone out of a crevasse or a hole if they don't. Um, we take a rope with us so we can get um, skis out of a crevasse if somebody loses a ski and that goes in or person, um, heaven forbid. Uh, crevasse, bits of crevasse rescue kit, ice screws, uh, pulleys, those sorts of things. Knowledge, how to use them, that's an important part of that equation. Uh, and then an ice axe as well. Um, and of all of those things, it's probably the axe which is the least um, used because uh, you've got your, your ski poles, um, things like that. Um, yeah, so so, and the axe needs to be quite small and fairly light. You don't want some great big long walking axe on the back of your rucksack. That starts to become a danger to, to yourself if you take a tumble. Um, and uh, ideally the blade's covered and it doesn't uh, present a hazard on your bag. With, with the crampons, Andy, I mean, th these aluminium crampons are, you know, often marketed, aren't they, at ski tourers? Is there a decision on, you know, do you take those, I suppose, depending on the ski tour and, um, you know, compared to steel crampons, which obviously bite in better? Yeah, al al aluminium's fine when you're carrying it and not so good when you have to use it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they kind of, if you get on, Let's say you're on the Hort route and you're going over the Pien de Roller and uh, as, as you come up higher to, uh, over the Pien, there's a roll. If there's an icy section on that, so the wind has taken the snow and it's minus 15 ice that's been wind blasted, you'll really, really want steel crampons for that because they'll bite when you kick in. If you've got a lot of experience and are very good on your feet, then the compromise of having aluminium ones and some of the there seems to be some more modern harder aluminium which seems to be better um but it's always a compromise um i would go for the steel ones uh, unless you are very confident in your footwork uh, if you've got an axe with you uh, you can still cut some steps for a short distance so you can get away with that compromise if you know you're going to be carrying an ice axe but if you've decided to save weight and not take an ice axe because you don't think it's necessary or you've lightened the weight of the ice axe by taking an aluminium headed one, then you should have steel crampons because uh, you've no other way of mitigating um, that, that sort of terrain. Yeah. Mm, mm. So the terrain we're going through, the environment that we're uh, traveling in, uh, our uh, mind is is move towards avalanches a lot of the time. That's the biggest consideration. Is is this a good idea? Is this safe? Uh, there's a picture there of um, a, a, risk, a risk reduction matrix. There's a variety of risk reduction matrices. We can uh, you can you can argue which one's the best, but the, the thing really is to have some idea how you're going to make these decisions. Uh, and this provides a template to to ensure that you're being um, systematic about what you're doing. Um, rather than just going with how you feel about it. Uh, uh, and a lot of the factors that go into the decision making in these uh, are, are fundamentally not the immediate things of saying, 
just purely what's the snow like um we we have all sorts of other things to consider in the nature of the team uh and um whether we're going on a long day or a short day what the um, um length of days the exposure those sorts of things so again it's a composite it's a very composite as a part of being just one thing it's what makes decision making hard in avalanche terrain um avoidance is often the the easiest thing and that comes in when things are spectacularly bad but um the majority of the time you're in an environment where it's a management issue um and uh, you um you apply systematic thought let's have the next slide oh that's back to that one so that i mean leave that there that's that was remotely triggered um so that was in bivio on the way to a hut and um a team coming up we were on our way down had triggered that from where we were stood um so it doesn't always happen where you are even if you're the trigger you might trigger something that's um not exactly where you are it's gone on the steeper terrain so the the angle of that was steeper and um it's also probably where the wind has deposited at the top so there's just a layer of wind slab sat on something but if you'd skied over the top of that and we try and avoid that shape at the top as well um then uh, you would have taken a little ride in the white room mm. so we have avalanche forecasts very good forecasting it's regional uh, the nature of the information as it's delivered is a little different region by region uh, this is a swiss one uh, and that would be a bad day in andermatt <laughs> <laughs> red is bad as a universal rule generally uh yeah so uh they must have had heavy snow and wind um recently i would say either that or the temperatures are suddenly rising um red there category four we've got a scale of one to five one being the safest and it's very rarely one five being appalling and that's hitting roads and everything's shut down so that makes things easy because nobody's going out um four a lot of the time on fours it's pretty obvious where not to go uh, and i think very few incidents happen on category four days three three is still considerable there's a very good chance of a victim triggered avalanche you know, you're you're going to be the thing that makes it shift um but it's still possible with good management and good route choice to find places that are safe and i think the majority of victim triggered uh, incidents occur on category three days as we go down category two is the classic well it's only two it must be safe uh no it's there's still a reasonable uh hazard uh and it still requires some safe decisions yeah. uh angle of the terrain so that's a, that's a fairly big factor in what's going to happen you can get something sliding on lower angle terrain uh but the consequences often aren't that great because it doesn't gather speed and it doesn't travel very far um but uh there's there's those peculiar angles of 45 to 34 on that thing there uh and that's worth avoiding if you're um category three or above um a lot of maps so the swiss produce uh winter maps that which have all their terrain above 30 degrees shaded pink that helps with your route planning if you've got a higher hazard um or you know there's a particular aspect um that you want to avoid it uh, gives you that uh, information quite readily uh, and then in the field just being able to look down a slope and have a good idea um, of judging the angle uh, is quite handy so with all that information in place you know with a with a, a good system of um appraising what you're doing and whether it's reasonable and what the conditions are like and whether that's something you should ski and what the outcomes might be if something does happen so uh, whether there's um cliffs beneath you or basins that you could get taken into um, once you're making good decisions and um, you have thorough reasoning uh, then you've got this incredible freedom to move around the hills uh, and it is with ski touring that's one of the great appeals is that sense of freedom you get to move around the hill in a way you just can't go in the summer and go and have a look over there and a look over here um, and enjoy your skiing and I guess just just the amount of terrain that you can cover, you know, in a day compared to what you would on on foot is just, um, you know, so much more, isn't it? 
yeah, the distances you can cover. I mean, it, a good example is the last day of the Hort route. I mean, it's two days in summer and it's a six, seven hour day uh, on skis. Um, yeah. And the majority of it is whooping fun. Sure. So, yeah, there's some other things we need to know and uh, things we teach when we do our introductory courses. Crevasse rescue. Um, so having the skills to get someone out of a hole. Just the basics. Um, uh, just being able to apply a three to one hoist uh, and pull somebody back up. Um, it's a very useful thing to know. And and the thing is, of course, when you learn the skills on a course, you um, you might not go away thinking you could confidently do them on your own, but you could certainly be uh, part of a rescue team and have an awareness of what needs to be done and um, play a part in that. Yep. So yeah, we uh, often use lifts in resorts. This is in Chamonix, uh, off on a nice little day tour, uh, Crochet Barrage Traverse. Um, and you come off the top of the lifts, you do a bit of skinning, you do a bit of boot packing, and you're over a column to a nice long um, ski traverse, bit of exposure. You want some good side, strong side slipping skills. Um, or out and about, this is in Austria, this is in the uh, Stubai, um, uh, big, high glaciers, great big open slopes. Um, yeah, good to have visibility in terrain like that. Very useful for uh, risk assessment. Yeah. And then you get the pleasure often of making your own tracks. So most ski areas now with people with fat skis and off-piece skiing so popular now that um, within an hour of the lifts opening, most things will be skied out. Uh, whereas um, if you go off to some quieter areas in the Alps, um, you can hike off into the middle of the hills and you'll find that there's plenty of space uh, to go and get some fresh tracks, even if it hasn't snowed for a couple of weeks. Um, we've got a great hut system in the Alps, so you can either ha have a day tour and have lunch at one of these huts or you can have a sequential tour or you can uh, go to a hut and use that as a base for a few days. Um, the hut's very well provisioned, dinner, bed and breakfast. It's communal sleeping, so earplugs are useful. Uh, some people get on with that better than others, uh, but it's quite comfortable. And uh, particularly over in Austria, uh, the huts uh, mostly have showers and a restaurant service. Yeah. Being able to um, cover this sort of terrain so that more ridge like more mountaineering -y. And, and it's very fulfilling to be able to skin up to the head of the valley and then put your crampons on and boot pack up the last bit to a nice summit um, it's got that feel of mountaineering to it um, you know straightforward terrain um, but uh, you know in the winter the mountains get higher as it were so peaks that are under 3000 meters even feel like the 4,000 meter peaks do in the summer. Um, you've got this you know, beautiful snow cover to it, uh, pristine white environment. Um, so you know, that, that um, mountaineering element um, to your days can be very rewarding, even though it's not te technically that challenging. It's still very pretty. Yeah. So, so we've just got a dozen or so slides, is that right? Are these the, um, just gonna take yeah. us on the, on the Hope route, which obviously yeah, so is um, probably the most famous Certainly, most famous ski tour in the uh, Euro European Alps. Yeah, it's a it's a big draw. Um, for a lot of people, it's their first uh, hut to hut tour. Um, so you've got uh, six days, and you you'll stay at five different huts. So you go from one hut to the other. Um, so the bit a big thing with the Hort route is because it's sequential. Um, it, you you need reasonably good weather. Um, the two reasons for that one is navigation, finding your way around. Uh, and the other is uh, you want stable snow. So if it's just dumped a load of snow, it might not be ideal. Um, or if you're at a hut in the middle of the mountains and it snows a lot, uh, it might not be safe to travel the following day. Uh, this, these, these are taken from a, um, from a, oh, a, a, a trip where the weather wasn't perfect. It was only just good enough to get through. Uh, and one of the big things with this group was, um, it was actually a very experienced group. Um, so a lot of the uh, team members had done a reasonably large amount of ski touring before and was coming back 
to finish off and do do, do the Hort route. Uh, so the mountain skills were high, um, and that made it uh, a stronger team uh, and um, a safer thing to maybe carry on in poorer conditions. You've got some sections where you are boot packing up moderately steep terrain. Um, if people are uncomfortable with that, we get a rope out and put them on a rope. Uh, generally, we don't put a whole team on the, on the rope at any point in it. Uh, it's just something there for if people aren't that confident with crampons and an axe. Um, some quite big stretches of glaciated terrain. This is the Trion Plateau, and so it's a great big glacier. Um, and that's taken from the hut actually on the side of it. That's getting to the, that can be one of the longer days. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, people are often <laughs> glad, glad when that one's over. Um, <laughs> get to the hut and get a brew and ready for something to eat. <laughs> <laughs> bit peckish, just have a snack before lunch. That's not a vegetarian one though, that one, is it? No, I didn't eat that. No, <laughs> no just, just posing. Yeah, that's a rosti. That's, a, that's the great Swiss trucker food. <laughs> fried, fried potatoes, eggs and bacon. What can go? What energy. Can, what do you not like about pure, that? Yeah. Pure, pure yeah. energy. Pure energy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the Dees Hut, one of the nicer huts on the Hort route. Um, so these huts will take well, up to 100, 120 people. Uh, they'll often be fully booked right through from um, late February uh, till early May because it's such a popular trip. Uh, there's various ways of doing it, so you don't always have to do the same sequence of huts. Um, uh, there are some variations, or you can lend them one day or shorten another. Um, coming into the hut, this is often the most chaotic part of the whole experience, is you come into the hut and there's everybody's skis, everybody's boots, you've got to change your footwear before you can go in, uh, and skins hanging up like tentacles for some beast that's going to catch you um, and then out the door in the morning um, you usually need the light you're not going to be setting off too early um, it's not it's usually not that easy to ski with a head torch you might just and so be starting um, as the tiniest bit of light comes into the sky at half five six o'clock and then as it's such a popular trip and um, there's often a lot of people around um, and then this was um, coming coming over one section and just having to have a group chat because um, conditions have turned on us. Um, we've got an hour or so to make it to a hut. I just want to keep everyone well informed, make sure everybody's well prepared for just getting our heads do, down and doing a straight hour to the to the hut and getting us out of this storm. Any more slides? There you go. There we are. Yeah, coming towards the end of it now. I'm not sure if on this one, on this series of slides, we didn't quite make it to Zermatt. Um, so on about a third of the ski trips and um, the ski touring trips, we'll change the itinerary just because of weather and conditions. OK, um, because they're, they're changing all the time. I mean, it can't be perfect the entire time. and you, getting a run of six perfect days in a row um, does, doesn't happen every week um, but the trick to safety in the mountains is always changing you know they you own the curtains you see what sort of a day it is you come up with a plan um, and that's that's how you do your safety um, that's okay. the top of the gem spits in the Stubai. Stubai is a beautiful area to start ski touring great huts the terrain isn't too challenging the days aren't too long the peaks aren't too high, 3,114 metres, as I remember. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just a wonderful place to start that journey if you haven't skied to it before. That, that's great, Andy. Th thank you for that. That um, was jam packed full of information and advice. Um, so, yeah, we're going to go go to a few questions now. Um, we've got the live Q&A function on the right. If people do want to ask questions, then um, Put them up there now and we'll we'll go through them there's one here from from simon from sheffield who could that be i wonder <laughs> i'm sure i know simon from sheffield he says uh, andy what's your favorite ski tour and what are you most looking forward to skiing next winter oh 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 it's really hard to pick a favorite um 
uh, I mean, the, the Stubai, I didn't, you know, the Stubai looks incredible, so open, and it almost looks like Antarctica. Yeah, it's really interesting. People forget. I mean, one of the great things about uh, mosquito touring season is you get to go to a lot of different areas. You don't go anywhere near in the summer. Um, yeah, because you've, you've got a winter environment now. So lower down, you've got snow cover and it looks like the high mountains. Well, it is the high mountains. Um, and so a lot of people, it's easy for people to uh, forget that, um, like the Stubai and the Erztal and over the Stelvio region in Italy, the reason me high mountains and it is glaciated is just they get a bit ignored um, by people being drawn over to uh, the, the Pennine Alps, the, the Central Alps, you know, Zermatt and Chamonix, those regions. Um, well, a lot of the terrain is too high and too steep. Um, not, not always that good for touring. Um, yeah, yeah, Stelvio good. now said it. Stelvio is one of my favourites. Um, got another, another couple of questions here. One of them is, do you have to change the itinerary much during, you know, your typical kind of ski week? You know, what 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 contingency contingencies do you have? So the answer is yes. We often have to change our itinerary. Um, like I, I said earlier, about a third of the times we we'll, we'll, we'll change things, and that's just dependent on conditions. You know, the the initial thing is always. You, you, get up in the morning have a look come up with a plan and 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 go with that uh one of the great things um that we have is uh, is the van so we, we the ski courses often have a uh the jagged globe Volkswagen transporter van and if uh, things aren't looking particularly shiny in one place well you can get in the van and go somewhere else um uh the trick is to go and find somewhere with good safe snow and reasonable weather uh, and then you can have some fun. Sure. Um, I mean, w w w one question is, um, you know, in terms of the sort of seasonality of the Alps, I mean, presumably with the with the higher sort of areas, you tend to go there later in the season. I mean, people often ask, you know, when's the best time to say go to to Silvretto, which I know we we ski there quite early, you know, compared to say the Oberland, where we we tend to go there, you know, in, in maybe as late as May. Yeah, so I mean, one of the great things with ski touring is you have a, such a long season. You've got six or seven months where you can ski tour uh, right from November through till May, uh, even into June. Um, so for uh, Ski Mont Blanc, it's not uncommon for people to be doing a Ski Mont Blanc in early June. Uh, and you often walk past people on skis in June when you're starting your summer season. Uh, the, the reason is the higher you go, the more stable you want the snow to be. And it hasn't had a chance to evolve because it hasn't been that warm because of the altitude uh, and you also want a good shot of reasonable weather you've got longer days and um, hopefully more settled weather you tend to get the stronger storms earlier in the season um, so you get the powder skiing uh, in January and February uh, and you get the spring snow and high altitude peaks in April May into June. Sure uh, there's a question here from Charlie um he, he or she is asking could you recommend some courses trips to gain some experience ski touring to build up to the Haut route i am a beginner skier stroke intermediate snowboarder okay well i mean we we run an introductory course um it's it's chamonix based so we do some um ski tutoring as well as as touring with that um I suppose the initial thing to make sure is that you have some experience of skiing off piste. So you have some ability uh, in uh, loose snow conditions. If you're a stronger boarder than you are a skier, well, you can get a split board. Uh, you've got to be a bit more careful about the nature of the tours you choose um, when you're on a split board. You don't want a four kilometer um, polling section at the end of it, which is easy for skiers to skate <laughs> and, and mi miserable for snowboarders. Um, so you look at your uh, descent profiles on the, when you plan those days for borders. Um, but if you have some competency uh, with loose snow off piece, some experience of it, um, then yeah, go and do an introductory course, um, and uh, that'll put you in a good place uh, to move on to doing the Hort route. Great. Uh, I've got a few more questions here. Um, 
Jenny in North Wales. Um, she says, coming from a mountaineering background and starting to do some longer ski touring, was meant to do Silvetta in April. Uh, what are the common mistakes, assumptions you see people making? Oh, <laughs> well, people's mistakes and assumptions are very varied. <laughs> uh, I think people underestimate how, uh, how, how how difficult finding their own way around will be. I, of, I often see teams of folk who um, have jumped into doing um, something like a sequential hut to hut tour themselves um, and have reasonable mountain experience, but not so much ski and ski touring experience uh, and haven't built up um, ski touring experience in the same way that they built up their mountaineering experience beforehand. So they haven't done a series of day tours and a series of short hut trips, maybe two day trips and then moved on. Uh, they jumped straight in because they have the confidence because they've got the mountaineering experience. But all of a sudden it, it does feel very different uh, and um, you, it, it's easier on skis to have more of an effect on other people as well than it does mountaineering. You can trigger a slope on other folks. Um, so that awareness of the specifics, um, it's good to build those up in a sequential way rather than jumping straight into uh, longer trips. Great. Um, another question here. Hi Andy, do you have a recommendation for a good all-round set of boots and skis for ski mountaineering? Boots, it's what fits, okay? So you can't beat comfy boots, okay? You can say, oh, they're a, they're a bit sloppy for skiing or, um, you know, I, 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 I wish I had my race boots on or something like that, but you're going to have them on your feet for eight hours a day and the temperature is going to vary a lot. So comfort is primary with that. And you might have to find you compromise a little on your ski ability with it. The range of modern ski touring boots is vast. So um, you need to take some time uh, and find somebody that's got experience of fitting those boots. It won't be one boot for everyone. Different brands and different points in their, their range will suit different people. Uh, for skis, uh, you will probably find that you'll have a personal preference for uh, a, a, a style of, of ski performance. Um, the modern all mountain skis uh, are fantastic. So there's been a period of evolution. We've got like 15 years now of trying to make the perfect uh, all terrain ski. Um, it should be bearing fruit by now. <laughs> and so there's a, there's a number of manufacturers that make what they call all mountain skis, uh, which aren't too heavy, which have good width underfoot, but aren't too wide. So I'm thinking something like um, um, Solomon Mountain Quest, um, which is, I think, 95, 98 midfoot, not too heavy, um, not too much side cut to it, um, performs very well. But having experience of your kit, you know, you, you, you buy a set of skis and uh, you might find initially you don't get on with, as well as you did with the last ones. But then when you learn to appreciate how it works like any other tool, um, you, uh, you learn to love it. Yeah. Sure. Uh, we've got a couple more questions. Uh, Jim is asking, um, what would you recommend for someone who's keen to go ski touring? but is not fully confident that they have the technique or stamina to go in a group with others who might be better and stronger? Um, I mean, you can always start by um, do, doing a day or two. Um, I mean, you can, I, I don't know if you want, want to do this with a group of friends or a peer led or, or with a guide, but um, you, could, you could get uh, someone to take you for a half day uh, and see how you got on with that. Um, I mean, you should be able to judge your fitness for skinning uh, from from your ability to you know, walk up a mountain. Um, so your hill walking ability will directly translate into your ability to skin. Your ski ability, um, to some degree, you can judge that on piste. Like I say, if you stand at the top of a black run and it's a little bit icy, can you get down it without feeling too worried? I'm not saying can you make linked turns, but do you have a repertoire of techniques to get yourself through that terrain? Um, that's what you're looking for. OK, we'll just take one final question. Uh, this is from Chris from Boat of Garden. What happens if you are stormbound in a hut, but you're booked into another hut for the next night 
and others are booked into the hook where you are stormbound. <laughs> well, that could get messy. Depends yeah. on how long. So yeah, typically the Hort route, you know, if if you have a bad weather day and you miss out on getting to the hut and you don't have a booking for the next day, I'm afraid it's the people that do have the booking for the next day that get in. So, so you, usually you can't get in, you can't change your hut bookings on the Hort route. Uh, you just get what you're dealt. Um, you can get stuck in huts for more than one day. Um, so I'd have a good repertoire of card games. Yeah, sure. Well, that's brilliant, Andy. That, that was really great. Um, just, yeah, so much uh, useful information in there. So um, thanks very much for, for joining us today. And um, yeah, if people want to find out more about our ski touring, um, you know, get some advice from ourselves, you know, uh, from Andy, then you can obviously email us at uh, info at jagged-globe.co.uk or um, or phone us on the on the normal number. So yeah, thanks Andy, and we'll we'll see okay. you again. See you all in the hills Bye. sometime soon. <laughs> right, folks. Well, I hope you uh, hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, next week we're delighted to have Robert Mads Anderson with us. So Robert is the author of the book Seven Summits Solo. He's uh, an expedition leader whose experience spans across the high mountains of our planet. He has a long history with Everest. Um, you might might have heard, might know that he led the 1988 Kangsheng Face Everest expedition. Um, and he has been to, back to Everest many times since then, has led a couple of expeditions for Jagged Globe to Everest as well as lots of other peaks um, and he's going to dig into all things Everest maybe sometimes some things controversial next uh, next week um, so just finally you know on the subject of Everest in Nepal uh, we still have a, a campaign running to raise money for our staff and Sherpas uh, who would have been working this spring but obviously you know not able to there's a there's a URL on the slide here um, in fact there's not on this this slide but you can find it on the news page it's uh, we've got a gofundme page it's it support the sherpas if you type that in you'll find it um, thank you to all those uh, who've already supported that with um, thanks for your generosity um, so yeah so that's it thanks again we look forward to sharing more stories and information about adventure in the mountains with you next week so uh, Tune in next week and we'll we'll see you then. Okay, thanks.